Welcome everyone. My name is Adrian Randolph, Dean of the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences at Northwestern University. And I'm so pleased to see that so many guests have set aside some time to join us and hear from our speaker, Professor Michael Rakowitz, who is a member of our very own Department of Art, Theory and Practice. Historically, cultures have changed and adapted to social, economic and natural forces. The mode of tonight's lecture through this digital medium is a reflection of our own adaptation over the last year. And I'm so glad that so many of you from across the US and beyond have been able to virtually join us tonight or whatever time of day it is where you are for this talk. I do hope that we'll be able to see you in person next time for the next uh, iteration of this annual lecture. Before we begin, I want to share a few technical matters. First, we're very pleased to offer closed captioning during this event. You've probably already noticed this at the bottom of your screen, and you can adjust the location and size of the text by clicking on the caption logo at the bottom of your screen. In that same location, you can also turn the captions off if you'd rather not have all the writing during this talk. Second, we will be taking questions at the end of this session, uh, or at least answering them at the end of the session or trying to. But during the talk, please feel free to submit your questions uh, in the, uh, using the Q&A uh, uh, function at the bottom of your screen. And my intention is to get to as many of those questions as possible. Finally, this lecture is being recorded and will be made available on our website in the coming days. Uh, and we will circulate the link once the recording is ready. Welcome to the Jeremiah S. and Helen James Lectureship on Assyrian Civilization and Culture, established in 1999 by the late Helen James Schwarten, a prominent and active member of the Assyrian community. The lectureship was conceived with the purpose of promoting and understanding scholarship of both ancient and modern Assyrian culture. Mrs. Schwarten's gift to Northwestern University was just one of the many ways in which she expressed her commitment to the Assyrian community. She sponsored educational and cultural events for adults, endowed hundreds of college scholarships for young people, formed a library and a museum, and helped countless immigrants make new lives for themselves in America. She was also a long-standing board member of the Presbyterian Homes and the McCormick Theological Seminary. As a young girl, Mrs. Schwarten fled Iran with her family and after three years arrived in the United States. A devout Presbyterian, she met her first husband, Jeremiah, Jerry, Sargis, James, at church. Mr. James, also an Assyrian immigrant, came to the United States while a teenager. In 1950, he founded J.S. James & Company, a building management firm, and later the James Investment Company. He also served as a trustee of the McCormick Theological Seminary and the Evans Scholars Foundation. Jeremiah and Helen James raised two sons, Edward and Kenneth, who followed in their parents' footsteps of philanthropy and devotion to the Assyrian community. And I'm delighted that Ed and his wife, Jeannie, are here with us, well, here, in this uh, virtual environment with us today. Ed and Jeannie, I've missed seeing you both, and I hope after uh, this crisis is over, we can meet once again in person. I also wanted to mention that their niece and nephew, Melissa Richardson and Carl James are with us as well. To all relatives and friends of the James family, a special welcome. Northwestern University is honored to perpetuate the educational tradition of the late Jeremiah S. James and Helen James Schwarten with this lecture series. So now let me introduce this year James's lecturer my friend and colleague, artist, Michael Rakowitz. Michael is the Alice Welsh Skilling Professor of Art in Northwestern's Department of Art, Theory and Practice, where he's taught for more than a decade. An Iraqi American conceptual artist based in Chicago and New York, Professor Rakowitz was educated at Purchase College, State University of New York, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His work has been shown in galleries and museums across the globe and is housed in public and private collections in London, Chicago, New York, Paris, and Kabul, among other cities. His innovative and provocative projects and publications, both solo and collaborative, have earned him some of the field's most prestigious awards and recognitions, including the Herb Alpert Award of the Arts in 2018 and the Nasher Prize for Sculpture in 2020, just to name two recent honors. 
It's Professor Rakowitz's meditative engagement with his Iraqi Jewish heritage and his profound and sensitive exploration of ancient Assyria and the recent destruction of its material remains that made him an ideal choice for the James Lecture in Assyrian Culture and Civilization. He's earned the admiration worldwide for his thoughtful and provocative projects that interrogated US-Iraqi relations, especially in the period following the US-led coalition that invaded Iraq in 2003. His long-term project, The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, has explored contemporary political inequalities and the displacement of humans and objects, often through creative interaction with Mesopotamian antiquities housed in museum collections or reconstructed at archeological sites in Iraq. Awarded the fourth Plinth Commission in London's Trafalgar Square in 2017, his Lamassu of Nineveh, on view from 2018 to 20, commemorated the sculpture destroyed by ISIS forces through a version fashioned from, among other things, empty cans of date syrup, thus also referencing a once flourishing food industry ravaged by war and insecurity. In his Michael Rakowitz Nimrud, commissioned by and currently on view at the Welland Museum at Hamilton College, he's recreated one of the palace rooms at the ancient Assyrian capital, whose sculptures were first removed by European explorers in the 19th century and more recently destroyed by ISIS forces in 2015. Professor Rakowitz challenges us to engage in new discussions about the preservation, destruction, and politicization of cultural heritage, and to confront urgent questions about public memorials and the commemorative function of art. So please join me, perhaps quietly in this environment, in welcoming Professor Michael Rakowitz. Adrian, thank you so much for that really wonderful and kind introduction. It's it's great to be with all of you here tonight. Is everyone hearing me okay? Well, I, I'm gonna, I, I'm looking at an empty screen, so I'm gonna presume that somebody would have told me if you can't hear me. So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, all right, great. Thank you, Francesca. I'm gonna share uh, my screen. So to everyone uh, tonight, I would like to say Shlam Lechun, Ti Lechun, and Ramsha Brecha. It's an unbelievable honor to be with you tonight and to give a lecture named in honor of Jeremiah Sargis James and Helen James Schwarten. In 2009, my wife Lori and I attended the, talk, the James talk by our late and dear friend, Dr. Dani George Uchana a man whose work has influenced all of my own. To be asked to follow in his steps humbles me, and I will try very hard to earn this incredible honor. When I moved to Chicago from New York in 2006, I had no idea of the large and long-standing Assyrian community of Chicagoland. Coming from a Baghdadi Jewish family that fled Iraq in the 1940s, I found that our shared histories, our grief for what we left behind and the joy of our continuation and survival binds us. Doing the work that I do, I have felt warmly embraced by the Assyrian community here and beyond in places like Los Angeles, London, Stockholm and Malmo. And so from the bottom of my heart, Ashtidak for all you have built and Basima. In 2008, I spent a great deal of time in Redfern, a largely Aboriginal neighborhood in Sydney, Australia, producing a project that involved Indigenous citizens and organizations from that community for the Biennale. I was struck by the overt racism in the city, the ongoing crimes against and the displacement of Native Australians, now 250 years running. But there was something done as protocol that I felt kept the problems and failures visible and made them present, something I've tried to do in my own work for the past two decades. In Australia, the acknowledgement of country is usually a statement or a speech made by an Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal to show respect to the traditional custodians of the land. I've often believed that the best way to forget someone important is to name a building after them, so their name disappears into an address, into the architecture. I'm sure similar 
I'm sure that similar things have been said about the acknowledgement of country. But as an outsider, I was incredibly moved when I heard this preamble spoken at every public speech. I thought about my own context as an American living on indigenous land taken from its original inhabitants. To live up to my commitment to the citizens of Redfern, I made a promise to myself that I would continue to remind those who had forgotten. Since my return to the US, I began all of my public lectures with this, an acknowledgement of country. We are gathered here and holding this event on the unceded traditional lands of Turtle Island. I myself am speaking to you today from the unceded land of the Kickapoo, Peoria, Potawatomi, Miamia, and the Ocheti Shahuin, the Council of the Seven Fires. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the indigenous community, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. We must also acknowledge that the institution hosting this talk was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land we do our work. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism on Turtle Island. So I wanted to start with a landscape, but this is not just any landscape. What you are seeing before you no longer exists. It's like being able to see the light from a star that died long ago. This is a date farm in Hilla, Iraq, that was destroyed in the aftermath of the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. So let's put some people in front of those date palms. My story begins with my mother's family, Iraqi Jews who were forced to leave Baghdad in the 1940s, eventually emigrating to New York. This photo shows my grandfather, Nisim bin Ishaq Daoud Bithaziz, with his family so large that they extend beyond the frame provided by the desert oasis backdrop. And you can see the tear that runs through the photo and nobody took a knife to this photo. Nobody tore it in anger. It bears the injuries of constant migration of moving from one place to another until they found a home. Beginning in the 1920s, my grandfather owned and operated an import export company called Davison's and Co. When he moved to the US, so did his company. The company closed in 1963 and my grandfather died in 1975. When speaking about Iraq, people have often asked me whether I prefer the word Mesopotamia. While referring to a geographic territory, something of an improvement over the tragedy of calling something by the name of a nation state, Mesopotamia is derived from Greek. And so I find myself fluid, referring to Iraq for clarity of what that place has become but also preferring our names, whether it is Bilad al-Rafidin, the land of two rivers, or Aram Nahrain, or Bet Nahrain, uh, between two rivers in Syriac and Aramaic. In August of 2004, I discovered a large red can of date syrup at Sahadi Importing Company on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. Sahadi's was one of the stores my grandparents frequented when they first arrived in New York. Finding this can was special. Date syrup in my family had always been made by hand by my grandfather Nassim before he died. After his death, our freezer full of jars made by him lasted many years. After we finished the last one, my mother had to settle for store-bought brands that came from California or Israel, which never had the depth or complexity of my grandfather's. My mother said they filter it too much, almost like they're trying to whiten it. It was an insufficient substitute. When I brought the second house can of date syrup to the cash register, the owner, Charlie Sahadi said, your mother's going to love this. It's from Baghdad. I looked at the label, which was clearly not marked product of Lebanon. And that's when he told me that the date syrup is processed in the Iraqi capital, put into large plastic vats, and driven over the border into Syria, where it gets packed into unmarked tin plate steel cans. It then crosses the border into Lebanon, gets a label, and is exported to the rest of the world. 
from 1990 until May 2003. This was one method that Iraqi companies used to circumvent UN sanctions. When I asked why it was still being practiced in August 2004, more than one year after the sanctions had been dropped, Charlie replied that prohibitive customs and security charges were to blame. Importing products directly from Iraq was just too much of a risk. It would be bad business. So after this impromptu first lesson on importing, I decided to further investigate the history of Iraqi exports beyond oil. The date syrup led me to dates, which were legendary in Iraq, renowned as the best in the world with a yield of over 600 different varieties. In the 1970s, Iraq was the, first chief, was the world's chief exporter of dates, and dates accounted for their second largest economy after oil. At its peak in the mid-1970s, the Iraqi date industry listed over 30 million date palms in the country. By the end of the Iran-Iraq War in 1988, this number had been halved to about 16 million. At the end of the 2003 invasion, only 3 million remained. In 2006, I reopened my grandfather's import-export company as a storefront on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, one of the centers of New York's Arab community, as part of a project called Return that endeavored to import Iraqi dates to the US for the first time in over 40 years. The storefront operated from October until the end of December of that year. Together with Sahadi Fine Foods, whom I was able to get interested in my bad business as good art, I signed a deal with an Iraqi company, Alfares, to import one ton of Khastawi dates from the city of Hilla. The dates were to be packed in boxes clearly marked product of Iraq. When I told Athir, the general manager of Alfares, that this would be the first product on US store shelves in over three decades to list Iraq as its country of origin, I added that if he and his company had anything to say to the American consumer, they could say it with the design of the box. And the result was wonderfully crazy. Amid all the swaying date palm trees and these bunches of dates that seem to be hovering mysteriously in midair, there's an art history lesson. On the top left is a photograph of the Lion of Babylon. The caption reads simply, Babylon, Iraq, genuine lion. On the lower right, another photo, Ishtar Gate, reconstructed. Indeed, the original gate was taken by a foreign power, the Germans, in the early 20th century and reconstructed brick by brick in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. That lion still remains. On the flap, they clearly list product of Iraq and even go so far as to print the flag. The narrative of the date's ill-fated journey to the US mirrored the plight of hundreds of thousands of Iraqi refugees as they waited in a line of cars that was four days long at the Jordanian border, only to be sent back and forth to Baghdad. Then finally Damascus, where the Baghdad-based company determined that the, the dates had spoiled. While 10 new boxes of dates were airlifted out of Baghdad and into New York City in December 2006, the overall transaction served as a surrogate for a larger tragedy. The dates ended up being released after three weeks of quarantine, during which time the small parcel underwent inspections by Homeland Security, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, the U.S. FDA, and the USDA. And here it is, a fruit that asks questions and scandalized government bureaucracies from Baghdad to Damascus to Brooklyn. And this is when the dates arrived in the store. Customers trying the dates. With a store open for three months without the main product, it left a lot of downtime. It was during these quiet moments that my attention was drawn to these labels and packaging of date syrup and date cookies that were product of Iraq, but could not say that they were, like they were victims of xenophobia, a veiled provenance. When you sit with an object long enough, it starts to tell you about itself and what it wants to be. The empty store made me think of other empty spaces like this emptied out museum. 
these are photos of the National Museum of Iraq after it was looted in April 2003 in the wake of the US-led invasion. I started to research the databases of the items believed to be missing, stolen, destroyed, or of unknown status in the aftermath of the looting. I began to imagine these objects coming back as a ghost. But like any ghost, these objects would have to look different in order to properly haunt. Suddenly, I thought of the provenance of the artifact which gave the looted item its value and the veiled provenance of the packaging of the Iraqi date products. And so began the Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, an ongoing series of sculptures that attempts to articulate life size the 7,000 plus looted archeological artifacts from the National Museum of Iraq and at other sites or destroyed in the aftermath of the war. Along with a team of assistants, I build these objects from Middle Eastern food packaging and Arab American newspapers that are found in Chicago and other US cities. Out of refuse and urgent vulnerable materials, these objects could be not rebuilt, but reappeared. And what's interesting here is that we're looking at a votive statue with his hands clasped in prayer. Votive statues constitute a large part of what went missing during the looting. Some archaeologists believe that when people went to the temple, they would leave this, this offering so that when they left, it was still there to represent you and pray in your place. I think of these objects as surrogates, as ghosts who represent the lost Iraqis. The word surrogate brings to mind, again, the notion of the substitute, as I mentioned earlier, with a date syrup. Substitute is derived from the Latin substituere, which comes from statuere, whose noun derivative is statua, or statue, which seems central to my work as a sculptor for the past two decades, making sculptures that are substitutions for other sculptures that have disappeared or have been destroyed. I've also been making Iraqi food in the diaspora using ingredients that are often different from the ones traditionally available in Mesopotamia, substitutions for those things not readily available to me or my family. The idea was not to make replicas, but to think about these things that have disappeared and come back as a spectral presence or a mutant. The size is the same, but its material culture is different. The looting of the museum was the first moment of pathos. It didn't matter if you were for the war or against the war. There was consensus that it was a catastrophe and that this was a loss for the whole of humanity. For me, this was a very angry project and that the collective outrage about lost artifacts didn't translate into an outrage about lost lives. And so here you get an idea of one of the works as photographed in the database and that it's, that's its recreation. And so this is the database that my studio and I use. It's the Lost Treasures from Iraq database at the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. They went live with this website in the aftermath of the looting for two reasons. One was to deter people who may be buying artifacts on the black or the gray market from buying something that didn't have a provenance number attached to it, didn't have any provenance number information. And then they could click on a number and do a kind of side-by-side -side comparison. Um, but the other uh, reason was to educate the global public on how much human cultural patrimony had just potentially been wiped off the map. And as you can see, when you click on the number, what comes up is the museum number information, the excavation number, the provenance, but then it also tells you the, dim the dimensions. And oftentimes it shows photographs of the object from all different sides, which makes the sculptor's job relatively easy. And so the sculptures are then put on this table um, along with accession cards. And unlike the accession cards in museums where there's maybe a few paragraphs on how the object was used, instead, what my team and I have done is we've listed the museum information from the Oriental Institute uh, database 
But um, after the description, there's a quote from somebody who's reacting to the looting of the National Museum of the Rock. So it's all these different actors that had something to say at the time, and it becomes this kind of fragmented conversation that's dispersed along the table. So here you have Fiorella Strica uh, saying that the Gulf Wars had the single positive result of awakening international interest for the culture of Mesopotamia. And then you have Satan's favorite poet, Donald Rumsfeld, talking about a vase. And he says, let me say one other thing. The images you are seeing on television, you are seeing over and over and over. And it's the same picture of some person walking out of some building with a vase. And you see it 20 times and you think, my goodness, were there that many vases? Is it possible that there were that many vases in the whole country? And then another quote from Dr. Dani Georgiouhana, who talked about one of the reasons why objects were taken that don't necessarily surface when you just have sound bites on the news. He says, this piece has a very nice story. It was taken by two young men during the looting. They took nine very nice pieces to their houses. They came to us after the looting and they said, don't ask us for our names or addresses. We we're in the museum at the time of the looting. We felt very sorry because we could not stop anything. Then they decided that they would take things and bring them back when it was safe. And they did it. As soon as we had the American soldiers protecting the museum, they brought back the nine pieces. And so as I found out the story about Dr. Donnie George, he became this hero in the whole story about um, the re uh, the reconstitution of this lost collection. And so one of the drawings that exists in a suite of four that are exhibited whenever this, this work is shown uh, really talks about his story. Dr. Donnie George Yuhana served as president of the Iraq State Board of Antiquities and Heritage and director general of the National Museum in Baghdad. In the aftermath of the museum's looting, he worked tirelessly to help recover some 50% of missing items. However, because the museum continues to be a soft target for insurgents, international policing agencies from Kuwait and Iran to Japan, Italy, and the US are for now retaining any confiscated museum objects. Under Saddam Hussein, Dr. George put tar took part directly in archaeological excavations in order to avoid Ba'ath Party meetings. And this is a very interesting detail. Because he was an Assyrian Christian, Dr. George, in order to hold the position that he had in Iraq, had to be a member of the Ba'ath Party, which was something that he disagreed with completely. And so he did what no museum director really does, which is to participate directly in the excavations so that he would have an excuse to send back to the central Ba'athist command with Saddam Hussein, and he would say, we found something incredible in Iskandaria. I'm sorry, I can't be at the meeting. So this circumvention of power was something that I really admired. Dr. George also sidelined as a drummer in a band called 99%, short for 99% of excellence, that specialized in covers of Deep Purple and Pink Floyd songs. And this is where I fell in love with the man. He was like an artist. And um, sorry, I don't. And, and one of the things that actually exists in the exhibition is a cover that I commissioned from uh, an, an Arabic fusion band called Ayub that's based in Brooklyn to do a version of Smoke on the Water using Iraqi instruments like Kanun, Oud, uh, Buzuk. And it serves as the soundtrack for the exhibition. And I'll play that cover of the song uh, for you right here.
So you get the idea. Um, so the whole thing builds up to this bazook solo by Tarakabushi and the whole thing kind of cascades um, and it's one more kind of uh, recreation in the work. After receiving a letter with the bullet enclosed from extremists who threatened to harm his family if a ransom was not paid, Dr. George resigned his post fleeing to Syria in, Iraq in, in August 2006. In December 2006, Dr. George arrived with his family in the United States, having accepted a position as a visiting professor in the Department of Anthropology at the State University of New York, Stony Brook. Ahlan was Sahlan, Dr. George. And so one of the things that had happened when the exhibition was up, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. George for the first time in New York City, shortly after he and his family arrived. It was a beautiful occasion, a brunch at a mutual friend's apartment to welcome him. Archaeologists and scholars all surprised Dr. George with a book. It turns out that when he fled, he had to leave behind his library of precious books on the archaeology and the history of Iraq. Each invited guest brought a copy of one of the original books so that Dr. George could recreate the library he lost in Baghdad in Stony Brook another substitute. When Dr. George met me, he was grinning ear to ear about the project, but his first questions were not about the artifacts. It was about his secret history as a rock and roll drummer. The art newspaper, a publication that covered the looting of the museum and Dr. George's subsequent efforts to recover the missing artifacts, uh, ran a headline along with my, my drawing of him playing the drums. And so he asked me, how did you get a picture of me playing the drums? And there are no YouTube videos of 99%. There's no MP3 recordings and there's no JPEGs. Um, and so I told him, I took this photo of him looking kind of bored at a meeting and then a picture of this guy and through the magic of Photoshop created this kind of uh, cons this compi compilation image and traced it. And so he told me that's archaeology too. And so uh, when I was in Chicago after I left New York, um, I got these photos from my gallery in New York, who was telling me that Dr. George was coming in a couple of times each week and he was staying for hours. And he would end up giving tours of the artifacts to gallery goers, visitors, the same way that he would have given a tour of the artifacts back in Baghdad. And he even rearranged the artifacts according to his own kind of convictions as, as an archaeologist. And so it was this very beautiful way that he entered into the project. Donnie told me that he saw a double preservation happening in the work a preservation of the work, but also a preservation of the culture of the Iraqi people, whether Assyrian, Chaldean, Babylonian, Jewish, or Kurdish. If you wanted to continue to cook your food, these were the wrappers that contained these ingredients in Arabic and English, and English packaging made for the diaspora. And it is the very material that people who come from Mesopotamia use to reconnect themselves to the place they lost, lost objects that are portals to lost places. Donnie told me that even if these works were not the exact color that they may have been in antiquity, the size was right. 
and he felt like he was surrounded once again by these old friends he had to leave behind when he and his family fled Baghdad. He told me, this is as close as I'm ever getting to these things again. And it becomes doubly sad uh, to realize that Donnie was right. In 2011, he passed away, unable to return. Ever since, I've dedicated this project to his memory. Another landscape is backdrop. This one is in London. Another museum is in the background, one that hasn't been emptied out. It's the National Gallery of Art. In front of the museum is Trafalgar Square. Trafalgar Square is a celebration of British, uh, British imperialism and militarism. And this is the fourth plinth. It was designed by Sir Charles Barry. I guess you can get knighted in England for building these really boring things. And it was built in 1841. It was intended to hold an equestrian statue of William IV, but remained empty due to insufficient funds. Since the late 1990s, it has served as a platform for temporary public art commissions. In late 2015, when I was nominated to submit a proposal for the fourth plinth, I was working with my studio assistants to research how we might reappear the Lamassu that stood sentry at the Nurgle Gate of Nineveh from 700 BC onward, but was destroyed by Daesh in early 2015. We found out this colossal sculpture was 14 feet in length. When I received the blueprints of the fourth plinth, I found out that it too measured 14 feet. So I thought, what else would I do? These Lamassu are held in the British Museum and were excavated by the British archeologist Austin Henry Layard in 1849. Thus, my proposal was basically an archeological magic trick. We have the base for a sculpture that disappears into the ether in 1841. Another one that reappears from the plains of Nineveh in 1849, then disappears again in 2015, only to reappear again in 2018. As part of the proposal, the jury asked for details on how the sculpture might be made in a way that can withstand all four seasons. Up until this point, all my work from this series was made using papier-mâché, and I knew I would need to choose a sturdier material. The date syrup just kept coming back as this product that was suffering from xenophobia in a way. The reasons for using the date syrup cans were myriad. They have these beautiful graphics and strong colors but I also knew that since they are metal, they would be able to stand up to the British weather. And so the second house cans came back. And then this is the most popular brand of date syrup that you can get in London on place, at places like uh, Edgeware Road. And you can see it says Basra date syrup. We all know where Basra is in the south of Iraq. The photograph that they use is actually a photo that's used by the Iraqi Date Ministry to illustrate harvesting methods. But then it says on the side, product of Netherlands. And I've never seen a date palm grow in Holland. So here's the unveiling. And here's the beast. The salvage of date syrup cans in this work makes present the human, economic, and ecological disasters caused by the Iraq wars and their aftermath. If you look at the ancient Assyrian panels held in encyclopedic museums, you will see that many of the friezes have date palms in the background with fish in the river, a lush ecology that's been devastated by the war. I became interested in the non-human lives, plants and animals that can't speak for themselves. It starts to fold in these different aspects, the cultural, human and natural tragedies. And it's really important for me that the Lamassu is having that conversation with everything else in Trafalgar Square. For instance, the lions at the base of Nelson's column, which is actually made from melted down cannons from the HMS Royal George. 
So it's the material culture of the victims of war facing off against the weapons of war. And so the thing to realize about the Lamassu is that these are sculptures that are basically high relief. They're not sculptures in the round. So they actually do have a back. And when I was placing the work in Trafalgar Square, the question was what was on the back. And at the Oriental Institute here at, uh, at, at the University of Chicago, it's one of the only places in the world where you can actually go behind the Lamassu. And what you can see is there is a cuneiform inscription and there's cuneiform inscriptions, which is basically the, uh, the, the, the Assyrian language um, was actually a, a kind of message between the artisan, the king, and the divine. And it was never supposed to be seen by human eyes. And so uh, facing about 70% of Trafalgar Square, one approaches the Lamassu, and you see that cuneiform inscription on the back. And it really kind of shows that this is something that has been displaced from its original uh, original context and, and, uh, and displaced from the indigenous people to which this cultural heritage belongs. And so it's a little bit like, you know, when you, when you look at a tooth that's been pulled, you have the shiny enamel, but then you see the root of the tooth. And so this is kind of like that root being exposed. And so this is a cuneiform inscription that reads Senacherev, king of Assyria, king of the world, had the inner and outer walls of Nineveh built anew and as high as mountains. The reconstruction of the Lamassu set on the fourth plinth allows an apparition to haunt Trafalgar Square at a time when we're witnessing a massive migration of people fleeing Iraq and Syria. I see this work as a ghost of the original and as a placeholder for those human lives that cannot be reconstructed that are still searching for sanctuary. Maybe for the first time in human history, we're all seeing the same ghost. It is a monument and an admonishment. And unlike the many Lamassu kept inside the British Museum, this recreation or rather reappearance stands outside with wings were raised, looking Southeast toward parliament and toward the foreign office where the decision to invade Iraq was made but also looking past them toward Nineveh, hoping to return in the future. After the Lamassu was unveiled, my studio team and I began to address the other large scale works and sites that were destroyed by ISIS. Since 2018, we have focused on reappearing the Northwest Palace of Kalhu or Nimrud room by room. Here's an architectural floor plan of the palace. Each room that we reappear is presented in the exact measurements as it was during the reign of Ashurnasirpal II from 883 to 859 BC. Inside the palace stood 600 gypsum reliefs of Apkalu and other benevolent deities. Of these, of these 600, 400 were taken by collectors and encyclopedic museums in the West, while 200 remained in situ. And then this is the before picture when ISIS set up the dynamite. And then this is the brutal destruction that happened in, in 2015. And it included the remaining iconic reliefs found throughout the building. The first reappearance my studio made from the palace was room N the side bank room of the banquet hall where Austria and Oscar Paul II would receive guests. The reliefs depict the benevolent spirits blessing the king and the kingdom with date palms, dates, and other flora from Assyria. In reconstructing a, a space of hospitality and refuge, this iteration of the invisible enemy should not exist, seeks to be site specific, presented at a time when those fleeing ancient cities like Nineveh or Nimrud are still searching for safety and rest. And so this uh, slide actually shows where each of the panels are. The ones that are marked in purple are the ones that were left behind. Uh, the ones that are not you know, show the destination of where they went after the excavations in the mid 1800s.
Around the time my studio began to build these reliefs, Bowdoin College in Maine conducted research on the reliefs in their, in their collection and found traces of these colors, which would inspire the, col inspire the colors my assistants and I chose for room N. And so you can see here that what has reappeared in the entire space, showing the pieces that ISIS destroyed, but also the empty spaces left behind when the palace was excavated from the mid 1800s onward. The aim was to place the viewer in the same position as an Iraqi who might have seen, who might have been in the, uh, who might have been inside the palace the day before it was destroyed, and to show the gaps that Iraqis have had to look through in seeing their own history. It is a palimpsest of different moments of removal that does not begin nor end with ISIS's brutal destruction. And so you can see here the removed heads of the two figures. In some cases, museums and collectors in the West did not want to pay for the shipment of an entire slab. And so a technique was invented where the, ex the excavators could simply slice off the outermost few inches of the gypsum, essentially beheading these figures. It offers a horrifying symmetry to what would happen in 2015 as ISIS carried out atrocities against local, the local communities in places like Mosul, whose citizens include uh, Syrians, Yazidis, Kurds, and Chaldeans. The caption that accompanies this work includes a quote from Lori Hinant. They dismantled the winged bulls known as Lamassu as purposefully as any decapitation they carried out in Mosul or the Syrian city of Raqqa. The beard and male heads of the statues are missing, likely taken to be sold on the black market as ISIS has done with other artifacts. They then wired the entire palace with explosives and blew it apart along with the temples of Nabu and the goddess Ishtar. And here you can see the Assyrian tree of life that's in the corner. some of the labels next to empty spaces. This is the installation of room F at Lom Jane Lombard Gallery in New York. And this is a section where all of the elements were taken off and sent to different places. In the early fall of, uh, of, of 2019, I, I exhibited room G. These are some of the panels. Um, while my studio team and I are still working with members of the local Assyrian community to find the packaging of foodstuffs or publications in Syriac that are used here in the US, there is this wonderful moment in the works where we have recreated the standard inscription that ran across each one of these panels in Assyrian cuneiform. And that standard inscription were like these boasts that would say Ashur Nasser Paul II, King of Assyria, King of the World, um, defeated his foes, had his enemies' heads uh, piled up like a tower, but then would also talk about these feasts in which he was able to feed um, his dominions. And so in September of 2019, the Oriental Institute celebrated its, its centenary, and they actually have one of the heads from Room G. And we had this kind of reunification of the body with the head. And it's accompanied by a caption from Sheikh Khalid al-Jaburi. Maybe we Iraqis felt hurt when we saw our monuments displayed outside of Iraq. We get hurt because it's our civilization. I wasn't as devastated when ISIS destroyed my house or when they killed some of my relatives because this is life, all of us die. But Nimrud was like a part of our family. This heritage was part of our lives, part of all of Iraq. 
And so this is the rest of room G installed at the Malmo Konsthal in Sweden. And for me in my studio, we approach this like a site-specific project because Malmo actually has this very large Iraqi community, about 12,000 strong. And Malmo, as many of you might know, is one of those cities that has been uh, uh, demonized by right-wing pundits around the world who speak about the ills of migration. And it's even been instrumentalized by people like Barack Obama. Um, but it actually is this incredibly warm community, and it was an honor to be able to engage with, um, with the community there, which includes a large Assyrian population. And so this is how it was installed. Room G was a banquet hall, and so you get an idea of just how big these spaces were. And also how much had been taken. And one of the things that was amazing about showing this in Malmo was that at the opening, um, the Iraqi Cultural Association, uh, led by Lina Al Nahar, who um, is in the picture here, showed up and they decided to host the the opening of the exhibition, and this be became a really important inversion of the kind of situation in a place like Malmo, where the refugee is always seen as the guest and it started to question who has the right to host, which is something that the Palestinian architect Sandi Halal talks about a lot. And so they essentially hosted uh, the opening of, of Room G and it became the most beautiful party. And so here you have the Iraqi community mixing with um, the local uh, Swedes. And before I knew it, all of a sudden behind me on the stage, these musicians appeared. And you can see that they're wearing these headdresses. And these headdresses are actually Queen Puabi's headdress from the Royal Cemetery of Ur, which is in the collection of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. So it's a little bit like what it means to kind of break the vitrine and start to use those things that belong to people um, by the people who are descended from, from those communities. And so it was this beautiful moment of joy um, that filled this space and bounced off the reliefs. And it's my belief that these reliefs will never be the same again. Um, and so I wanna play for you um, a little snippet of what it was like that night. <laughs> just this wonderful moment of joy. And of course there was food, um, the incredible kubba, the tashrib, the lahm mirjin. And then these are uh, photos that were taken by members of the community where they had these awesome filters, which I loved, uh, started to remind me of those photographs. Uh, from Baghdad that my grandfather's family brought back with them. There was dancing. It was really like a shali. And so this is one of the things that happens. And so the work that I did became this landscape and a backdrop. 
And when I think about like the groupings of people that come together around these works, I'm reminded by something that the curator, Carolyn Christoph Bakarjiev has written about my projects. And she says, Although objects, their fabrication, their accumulation, and their exhibition thus form a major part of your practice, this aspect of your work is in, as in a counterpoint is contrasted with an immaterial and relational component of your work, less readily visible in your exhibitions, but very substantial in your practice as an artist who makes public art. In many of your projects, a dialectic is indeed set up between the care for and production of material heritage objects on the one hand and the attention toward immaterial heritage and its, and its production on the other. Although your art is focused on objects and object making, these objects make sense only in so far as they are relational objects. There is always an original lost object by which people have been disconnected and your enchanted objects are relational in so far as their coming into the world occurs through their reconnection in an embodied manner by a, collector, by a collective of people fabricators. And so a photograph like that for me starts to mend a photograph like this. And this leads me to more questions about the doubles that I've been making. The substitutes, statues of statues. They are imperfect, a reappearance of something that has disappeared, made from vulnerable materials that will one day themselves disappear. But isn't that what any good ghost does to reappear only to disappear again? Something happened this past winter. A documentary on my work was made by Art21. In the interview, I talked about the departure of Iraq's cultural heritage and connected it with the departure of my family after the Farhud, the violent dispossession of Iraq's Jews during riots in 1941. The camera eventually focuses on scans of old family albums. After viewing the documentary, my mother called me to tell me I made a mistake. The wedding photo of my grandparents were not my grandparents. My mother reminded me this was not the first time I made this mistake. The photo was of my grandfather's brother, Salim, who looked a lot like my grandfather and married Marcel, my grandmother's sister, who looked a lot like my grandmother. When my grandfather died, I was not even two years old, but according to my mother, he was my first best friend. My mother tells me I grieved his loss and went into a depression. But then during the Shiva after the funeral, I saw my uncle Salim. I thought it was my grandfather and kept trying to get him to talk to me. He stayed silent. My mother said to him, Salim, he thinks you're my father. Please say something to him. He didn't. And so these objects that I make with my team can never ever be the originals, which are gone forever. They can only ever be reminders. An Uncle Salim masquerading as my grandfather Nisim. But maybe the material from what it is made holds the DNA of our will to continue, to remember. This is my mother, Yvonne, on the left with a typical Shabbat meal that she prepared. You can see the beautiful pile of stuffed grape leaves and eggplants. Many Iraqis or the people of Bet Nahrein, including the Syrians, call this dolma. The Iraqi Jews call it mhasha which is derived from mashi, which means stuffed in Arabic. But my mother always called it minhasha. Other Iraqi Jews have told me my mother is mispronouncing it and that it is mhasha and that her mistakes must be because she did not grow up in Baghdad 
and was raised mostly in the US, so the dialect changed. Yes, it would have been different if the conditions had been such that my mother could have grown up in Baghdad. So I will always call it Minhasha, and its imperfection is my love for my mother and also the mark of displacement and subsequent change. A wrong word, maybe, but for me, a substitute. A substitute that reminds me that in all of my conjurings of my family's homeland, my belonging here can only, my belonging there can only ever be through an insistence to remember what my grandparents, what my grandparents did, despite the pain and despite the pressure of assimilation when they got to the US. I have kept that transmission of heritage uninterrupted, but it will always be different from one generation to another. It lives like an enzyme, changing proteins and making new cultures. And so I leave you with a video of me teaching my son Jude to make the minhasha, but he comes up with his own descriptive word for it. Show me what you're doing, Jude. I'm making grape leaves meat burritos. Okay, now let's have a look at it. Very good. Thank you very much, Basima. Thank you, Michael, so much for that uh, sensitive ending to your talk on intercultural problems uh, through the ages. Uh, it's wonderful to see your son. Uh, I, I thought the, the reference to the burrito was uh, apposite. Um, the Q&A is open. So please, those of you who have listened and have questions, please uh, feel free to put your questions in. I'll try to kick it off, Michael. Uh, I think probably stating the obvious, uh, you produce uh, this wonderful haunting analogy between objects and human bodies, uh, between lost objects and lost humans, families. Uh, I'm curious about this analogy because of course, the looting and the destruction that we're aware of uh, through history uh, is tragic and difficult. And yet you are trying to sort of pull museums and archives and collecting, let's say in a broad uh, way back into discussions about not just individual memory, although that weaves its way through your talk, but also a type of cultural restitution, uh, a type of uh, archaeology of justice. Is that too much to put on your work? Is there some type of way in which it's not simply meditating on the ghostliness of this, uh, these uh, offerings to us, these remnants that you uh, reconstitute in your work, but also a type of putting things right? Is, is that too much weight uh, to put on collecting, collecting uh, museums uh, and gallery work of the sort you're doing? Uh, or do you see yourself more as just pointing this out? I suppose, in other words, is your work participating in an active way of doing something, uh, or is it more a meditative reflection on these matters? Well, I, I think it's it's both. I mean, and I think it began as as one thing, and as time has gone on, it's it's um, it's about others as well. And I think that as we talk about you know what it means for there to be some kind of justice that's connected to the museum, which is created upon the kind of foundation of colonialism. And that, you know, you can't even use the word Iraq without it being something that is an artifact of, of a colonial um, kind of uh, fragmenting. And, and also like also this kind of um, forcing together of a lot of different indigenous populations. Um, but at the same time, you know, those, those kinds of, of regimes of collecting, you know, have created, you know, this, this kind of uh, this, this sphere of modernity that we're, all, that we're all complicit in, 
you know, that we're all participating in. And so as I think about, you know, how we lo look at that in a visionary way, and we think about, well, you know, what, what should we be doing? You know, what should be deconstructed? What should be kind of looked at as a kind of apparatus of, of, um, of restorative justice, I think about you know the museum and its anatomy, and every museum that I know of um, has a restorer, it has a conservator. And so if we think about restoration of artifacts, we should also be thinking about that in the same window when we talk about repatriation and restitution, because I believe deeply that these things should go back. Um, but at the same time, when I think about restitution, I don't want it to fall into the trap of apology. You know, apology is often uttered uh, for the person who's saying it as a kind of uh, alleviation of guilt. Um, it, it, it's, it's not always something that necessarily hears, heals the person who's receiving it. And so I think that something that is restorative, you know, with these artifacts would, would, be, would kind of uh, take into account the relationships that have formed around, around where these objects end up. Um, and so I think about those things, but I also want to be led by those communities, you know, that are asking for their objects back, you know, to be thinking about what, what that actually looks like. And I also think, you know, that, that museums for me have always been this kind of space of tension. You know, when I was 10, after my grandmother died, we went to London to visit her brother. Um, and my mother took us to the, uh, the British Museum. And she brought us immediately to the Assyrian galleries. And she explained, you know, the, that the Assyrians, you know, were an indigenous group, that they were indigenous population that was, that's still alive, um, that my grandfather knew Aramaic, he knew Syriac, uh, that our dialect of Arabic comes from the north, from places like Mosul. Um, and that while, you know, uh, and that this was the first, like the Lion Hunt of Ashurbani Paul, you know, was the first comic book ever, that it was sequential art. And she said, it comes from the land, um, not far away from where your, your grandmother was from and where I'm from. And, and there's nothing cooler than being 10 and hearing that you come from the place that's not so far away from, from the first comic book ever. And, um, and then she said to me, and what's it doing here? And so immediately, you know, these places were not just these polite reliquaries uh, that were about exchange among the world's cultures, it was like a crime palace. And so, you know, I think about that, but I also think about the fact that we have communities from those places now that are separated from their, their homes. And so what do those objects mean for them in these museums? You know, and those are the difficult places from which I want to make my work. And so, you know, I do think that there's something about restoration that I'm interested in, but I also want to hold the space, you know, about what it means for, uh, for the people to also not be able to, to return. And the one thing I will say about like the destruction of places like Nimrud is that, you know, if, if you could imagine um, ISIS, you know, making a declaration to the world that said that we're going to destroy these 200 remaining reliefs unless you take them. Uh, every, every museum would have, would have, you know, gotten their government to open up the borders and to take in these, these artifacts. But if they were going to say, we're going to kill these 200 people that live alongside the artifacts, the borders would have remained closed. And so I'm, I'm really, you know, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to interrogate is the valuation for the objects and, and how that has led to a kind of devaluation of the people. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, uh, that's clear when you're really, when you go see your work, I think that analogy becomes clear. And I think that helps us feel as if objects are pulling us toward uh, the politics of, you know, displacement, refugees, violence, etc. There's a couple of questions about how do you square this? this is obviously a very multicultural uh, part of the world. And I think you, you know, you tried to 
uh, bring in the indigenous identities, the different linguistic traditions, the different historical traditions, uh, but you're also uh, coming at this from a particular subject identity. How do you feel? I mean, has that been both enabling? Have you found it to be difficult? Uh, you know, you're obviously negotiating a lot of boundaries. And I'm just curious, uh, as you reflect back on this work now, this multi-year project, especially about the, the reconstitution of these lost objects, uh, how you feel about that? How I feel, can you, can you sort of say what, what well, I mean, obviously, there's so many different potential identities, you know, whether it's linguistic, historical, religious, etc., that are seeing a past through these objects that we call Assyrian, and there's many Assyrian uh, community members here. I'm just curious how, you know, in reflecting on that, how do you feel as uh, someone, I don't know, I don't want to say how you identify, but how you identify in relation to this historical tradition, have you found it difficult? Uh, have you found it enabling? Has your identity shifted through the project and how you see yourself addressing these objects, both lost and still with us? Yeah, no, I, I think that it's an important question because I think as these things started to kind of, you know, render themselves in more high relief for me via the relationships um, that I formed around them, like Dr. Dani Georgiou Hanna was very adamant about, you know, talking about how uh, he felt as though the the good things, you know, in in this in a place like Dohuk or or Baghdad or any of the places where 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 he um, was was working was that you know there was a feeling that. Um, the work didn't belong to anyone, but 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 that all the people belonged to the work. Um, that in a way it was was you know in, in a kind of way it was a little bit the way that indigenous people you know talk about the the land does not belong to us; we belong to the land. Mm -hmm. And and you know, and it, it, hearing him talk about that is different than like what happens when you know the government of Iraq puts the Lamassu on one of its dinar notes. You know, mm -hmm. and you think about just the atro the atrocities that have been visited on the Assyrian people. Um, you know that that you know the, there's not enough time to even like go into the expanse of time in terms of you know the the thing that we don't often talk about in the context of the Armenian genocide is also the genocide of the Assyrians and so you know those kinds of appropriations can be very very difficult and so for me I've always you know tried to move in a way where um, you know I've been in conversation with people in the community I work with um, the Sha'er family um, when it comes to the culinary projects that I do around cooking. And then um, also with us tonight is someone named Rita Merza, who um, at a certain point visited my exhibition at the MCA in Chicago and pointed out, you know, the moments when something was Assyrian, you know, and, and not Iraqi. And so, you know, that that kind of tension exists in my own community as well, you know, about whether somebody calls themselves an Iraqi Jew, a Babylonian Jew, a Baghdadi Jew. I don't want to be defined by nation state names, but at the same time, you just find yourself so fluid between these terms. But in terms of like my own identity, the one thing that I can say, you know, is that my, my, my family and its ancestry owes a lot you know, to Assyrian culture, because, you know, this is actually a Haggadah from Baghdad. It's the same edition that my grandfather brought back, brought with him, you know, when he had to leave. It was published in 1936. And it's not in this thing called Judeo-Arabic, which is in itself, you know, like Ella Shohat says, an invention. Uh, so it wasn't like a Yiddish that partitioned the Jewish community from other um, members of the Baghdadi community. But it's, there are moments when it's Arabic in Hebrew letters. And so it's a transliteration. Mm -hmm. But there is so much Aramaic that's in here as well. In fact, one of the most popular songs during the Passover Seder is called Chad Gadia, 
which is not Hebrew. It's it's uh, it's Aramaic, meaning you know one little goat, and and so those kinds of moments, like you know, you find yourself uh, realizing that the, there are these overlaps, and the people that I've been able to actually say Ashdidak to, you know, who understand me are my Assyrian friends here in Chicago. Um, but that's because there's like a shared uh, dialect of the Arabic. Um, so for me, it's something where it will probably continue to shift. Um, and like I said, you know, there's a real desire, you know, for me to to put Syriac into, you know, this kind of compost of different languages that make up these uh, these reliefs and these objects. Um, but you realize like there isn't a Syriac newspaper here in Chicago and you realize that none of the ingredients that the Assyrian community gets to make its food here um, come packaged in Syriac. You know, it's always Arabic and English. And again, it becomes this moment of substitution. I think that's fascinating. I think this palimpsestual relationship with language material objects and history is uh, something we could continue to speak about, but I think I have to draw this to a close. I wanna thank you, Michael, for you know, your work and your careful way of explaining it. I know everyone's grateful to you. So if we could clap, we would, uh, but in the absence of that, we'll have a moment of silence after this that uh, everyone will be sending good vibes uh, toward you. Uh, Thank you uh, for everyone who attended. We appreciate uh, your time, your energy, your questions, your thoughts. Uh, I hope that we all can gather again next year in person or in the future for events at Northwestern. And thank you again to the James family and to uh, the supporters of this lecture. We really appreciate your friendship and loyalty to uh, this project. So with that, good evening and be well. Thank you.